Well, if you can, and if you'd like to, I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. I'm just going to read a, a part of one verse from Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. And listen, hold on real tight, because I'm going to read from the King James Version. I knew some of you would get happy about that. Just the, 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 the version that Jesus used, obviously. Yeah, the disciples, they all they use the King James Version. Um, and so I'm, re I'm, I'm using from the only real, authentic, genuine, correct, and anointed version of the Bible, Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish perish. Let's pray together one more time, can we? Father, thank you so much for your word and the truth that it contains. As the one who has the privilege today of bringing the word, I ask that you would anoint me in some way, Lord, by your spirit, to share with these precious friends who are in this room, those who are watching online, those who are listening later, Lord, what you have placed within my heart. I ask it all. Give us the ability to hear today with ears more than just physical ears, but with our spiritual ears and help us to see with our spiritual eyes in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Ask somebody before you're seated, do you have a vision? Just ask them, do you, do you have a vision? Do you have a vision for getting out close to 12? <laughs> now, I'm going to drag somebody into this message who has no idea. Well, it's not really the message, but uh, Dylan, you're a, you're a professional trainer, right? We were, we were talking about that at breakfast this morning. Um, you, you sat next to me at breakfast this morning. You saw what I ate. I, I did pretty well. I mean, not perfect, but did, did pretty well. I had a biscuit, okay? I had some grits and eggs and some turkey bacon. And you're seated back there behind me, so you may not have been paying attention to me. I hope you weren't because I wasn't doing this for you. But I was up here clapping and dancing and moving and jumping up and down. I just want your professional opinion. Did I work off any of that breakfast this morning in church? That's, that's, I want to get right to it. Did I burn a few calories, you think? I did? Do you think I, I made room for lunch? So I'm just trying to help you. When you come to church, you can come for a lot more reasons than just something spiritual. If you would actually move a little bit, watch, help me, Dylan. Come on, he's passing out business cards after church today. Uh, then you could burn off some calories. You could fight the devil. You could get limber and get movement going in them joints that are creaky and crusty. And I, look, I didn't even plan on saying this, but I feel the Holy Ghost uh, right now. <laughs> So that's just my workout routine. I, I won't do that again very soon. So for most of my life, um, I've had pretty good vision. I, um, I was able to read things up close, small print, and I could read things way down the road. Um, I noticed, though, as I got into my 50s, um, that I wasn't reading my cell phone as well. And I don't know about Androids, because I'm a Christian and I have an iPhone. And um, why, why? I made two truthful statements. Did I not? John Carmichael, did you hear me? I said, I'm a Christian. That's true. And I have an iPhone. Now, anything that you took beyond that is between you and the Lord. <laughs> but John and Angie have iPhones. I know that. Yeah. Others have been. Okay. So anyway, uh, and I noticed, I don't know about Androids, but iPhones have a feature that you can enlarge the text size on your screen. So I started bumping that up just a little bit. And then I found this cool button where you can bold the text. And so not only is it larger, but it's, it's thicker because it's bold. And so I noticed, you know, over time, I, I started getting these little cheap reader glasses so that I could read my Bible. And occasionally I'd put them on in the pulpit or either I would use my iPad and really enlarge the, the, the text on the screen. And then I noticed I got to the place to where I wasn't just having a tough time reading like my Bible or my phone. I was having a tough time reading my 17-inch laptop screen. Yeah, and you can adjust the size of that. So I bought me this big honking desktop monitor on my, in my office that I now throw everything up on there so it's even larger. And I noticed that I was having a little hard time reading that. So I finally listened to the Holy Spirit who sounded a lot like my wife and I decided I'd go get my eyes checked for the first time in my life. I think for the first time in my life, other than maybe in grade school, I think they used to test you. And so anyway, this guy's there who I've never seen before and I noticed he's wearing glasses. I'm like, okay, well, that's cool. And so he's doing all these tests and doing all this kind of stuff. And, and at one point, he's asking me all these questions, questions, questions. And, I, and so finally, he kind of finishes and he says, did you know that you need help seeing up close and at distances? 
And so look, y'all, he's wearing this white coat. He's got his name on it. I figured he knew what he was talking about, so I just kind of went along for the ride. And he wrote me this prescription and got me these glasses that have transition lenses. That means at the bottom, that's designed to read something, you know, close, like your phone or whatever. And then in the middle, it's kind of like your, your computer screen. And then at the top is to see way down, way down the road. Well, sometimes what happens is I'll get some of you in the wrong part of my glasses, and it feels like you're right here in my face. <laughs> and then sometimes I want to go, hey, you way over there. Come on back in the building. And you're actually sitting in here. So it's kind of weird. you got to get used to it. But I, so I got these glasses, and then... You know, I struggled for a while with putting them on, leaving them on. They felt weird and all that stuff. And uh, so I go back and I had to get them adjusted or something. I think the frame was something weird with it. So I go back and get them adjusted. And when I took them off, I, I was standing right where I had been standing before. And I remembered um, a, uh, something that was on the wall at a pretty good distance that the last time I was in there, before I put my glasses on, before I got my glasses, that I could read way across the room. And without my glasses at that point, I could not read way across the room. And here's my summary of all of that. I think the guy corrected one problem, but created another problem for me. Because I, I used to could read way down the road. Man, I'd be reading license plates like four or five, six cars ahead of us or street signs way down the road. Now, Missy has been just different. She could read everything real close, but not as much at a distance. And so I would always tell her stuff that's way, I don't know how you can see that. And so I, I say all that to say this, throughout my journey of life, and then especially the last year and a half or so with glasses, I've discovered that, that sometimes even, and I heard somebody kind of say this in passing through this process, that sometimes after you get glasses, it will affect other aspects of your vision that used to be okay, and now all of a sudden, this is me. I don't know about you, but this is me. I feel like now that I'm kind of chained to these glasses so that I can see up close in the middle and way down the road. I realized in preparing for this message that about 35% of the U.S. population have 20-20 vision. That's without any corrective measures, glasses, lenses, surgery, or whatever. And then with those corrective measures, about 75% of Americans have 20-20 vision. So that still leaves an entire 25% of the population, which would be about 75 to 80 million people in America who really don't see all that well. Um, and so I'm just encouraging you to count off the cars parked next to you and just kind of do the math and let people get out of the parking lot before you crank up because you could be parked next to somebody who's still as blind as a bat. Y'all, that's what I'm trying to tell you. My name is Shell and I'm your friend. I'm here to help you, all right? So I want to talk on this subject, as you see on the screen, 2020 vision. And I want to share some things that the Lord's put in my heart. And then I want to share something with you that's really of a more personal nature that God wants me to share with you publicly, something that he revealed to me that I, I hope is going to help you, and I believe that it will. So I want to move quickly as I can into the message. I hope you got your message notes, you brought something to write with, but look to your neighbor and tell them vision is really important. But you tell them just say vision is really important. Now, not just physical vision, but as I'm going to share in this message, spiritual vision, but it's also connected with your natural vision. In our opening text, we're told that vision is so important that without it, people perish or die. Now, I think the New King James and some other more modern translations than the, than the King James will render that phrase, where there is no vision, the people live unrestrained lives. Or where there's no open revelation of God, the people live unrestrained lives. The truth is, is that if if we don't have some understanding of God to guide us and direct us, we will live lives that are tremendously displeasing to God. Where there's no vision of God, the people perish. Now, the Bible speaks often about the importance of having a relationship with God. Jesus came from heaven to earth to provide us with a more intimate, close relationship with God that had ever been experienced before. That's the, kind of the story of Christmas and Easter all rolled into a couple statements. But I want to use this opening verse of where there's no vision, the people perish, in, in the context of making it more personal to us. Because you see, I really do believe that we've moved into this new year, 2020, 
And I, I shared last week about a New Year's revelation, and I mentioned some things that I feel like God laid on my heart that were important for us to recognize about how God wants to reveal things to us about, about past circumstances, present, future, all those kind of things. The week before that was a New Year's revolution, not, not resolution, but revolution. Last week was a New Year's revelation. And today I want to start talking about this concept of vision, having a 2020 vision, not just for the year, but being able to see things with greater, greater clarity. How many of you would admit that there have been a lot of things in your life that you've just not really understood very clearly? Anybody besides me? Well, I want to I want to hopefully share with you some things from Scripture that will help bring clarity where maybe there's some confusion. The first thing that I want to suggest to us today is that God wants us to have 2020 hindsight. Hindsight. Now, hindsight is defined as an understanding of a situation only after it ha has already happened. Have you ever heard the phrase hindsight is 2020? Well, what that means, if you're not familiar with that phrase, is that once you've come through something, when you turn around and look at it from today's perspective, looking backwards, you begin to see and recognize things that you didn't see and recognize when you were going through it. I want to suggest to you that sometimes it's only after you've lost a job and got a better job that you can appreciate the fact that you lost that previous job. Sometimes when you get down the road and you turn around and look backward, you can now thank God that she did break up with you in high school. Because you found her on social media, you weren't looking for her, but you found her, and you just started right then speaking in tongues and thanking God that that relationship ended all those years ago. Because you'd have been drugged down that same. Y'all are so holy, you acting like you don't know what I'm talking about. And you look backwards into a situation and you go, oh, yeah, now I see it. I, I get that. Well, you may just remember last week I shared a verse almost in passing in the message. But this concept of having 2020 hindsight, being able to see things after you've come through them more clearly, is actually a biblical principle. It's Jeremiah 2320, where God tells Jeremiah, in the days to come, you will understand all this very clearly. In the days to come, Jeremiah you're going to understand all of this very clearly. Now, that particular chapter is an interesting one. Um, there was a time that I could not have quoted this verse. I didn't remember intuitively what Jeremiah chapter 23 was all about. But it came to life in, for us as a, as a family, and me and Missy in particular as a couple, back in 19, um, no, excuse me, 2002. Yeah, it would have been 2002. We were serving in, uh, in no, it wasn't, that wasn't that early. It was, it was just before we left New Orleans. And who? Y'all pardon me. We're just getting caught up right here. It was 96. We went there in 89. We were there five years. So in the 2000, in, in, in the 1994. Okay, it was, it was next year when it really had, it hadn't happened yet. I'm, no, I'm just kidding. So whatever year it was, I think it was 1994. 1994. It was 1994. Um, our pastor, Roger Brumbelow, accepted the pastorate at a church here in Atlanta and resigned. He invited us to join his staff, and I resigned on the same day, against his recommendation, I might add. I'm just throwing that in. I want to give him credit. He said, no, you, you really ought to wait. Announce your resignation later. I said, no, they know we're so close. They, they're going to know we're going, and if these people push me hard enough, I will confess to killing Lincoln. I just, I don't want to be in that spot. Let me resign the same day you did. He said, okay. So I, I did. And the board asked me to stay on during kind of the interim time um, and, and postpone my, my departure, which I was, I was more than willing to do. Well, we got to December of 1994, and I'm having conversation with Pastor Brumbelow, and uh, it kind of went like this one night on the phone. He said, Chell, I, I hate to tell you this, but I've gotten to the church, and I just need to tell you that the church is in a real difficult place financially, and I'm not sure that I'll be able to bring you on staff here in Atlanta. And in that moment, all of the emotion of realizing, wait a minute, I've already resigned. And if I'd have kept my mouth shut like you told me to, I wouldn't have anything to worry about. <laughs> but I've already announced my resignation. They know I'm leaving. Uh, and now you're telling me I have nowhere to go. And in that moment, I was overwhelmed probably like any other time up to that point in my life. 
And as I'm laying in bed, and I'm, and I'm not even really wanting to tell Missy about this conversation that I've had, I'm trying to process, I uh, heard the Lord say, read Jeremiah chapter 23. And so I, I went into our family room, and I opened up the Bible and began reading Jeremiah 23. And I'll summarize it for you. God says to Jeremiah, he says, the prophets are prophesying falsely in my name, and I'm going to kill them. I thought, well, now there's some encouragement. <laughs> I got out of bed for this. <laughs> he said, no, keep reading, keep reading. And God says to Jeremiah, they're prophesying falsely. They're telling the people, peace, peace. And I have told them to tell the people Dest destruction is coming. Judgment is coming. And they're lying. And they're lying in my name, he tells Jeremiah. He says, I'm going to send a whirlwind of my destruction upon them. And I'm going to do it suddenly because they are prophesying falsely. And I'm processing all of this as I'm reading it, thinking, what are you telling me, God? I mean, are you telling me you're going to kill me? You're telling me I'm a false prophet? What are you trying to say? And he said, keep reading, son. And I get to verse 23. And when I got there, I broke. And he said, that's what I wanted you to see. He said, Shell, I told Jeremiah what I was doing, why I was doing it, when I was going to do it, and how I was going to do it. But I let him know you still don't understand it, but the day will come, you'll understand all of this very clearly. And God told me, he said, Shell, the day will come, you'll understand all of this very clearly. And I just feel like somebody here this morning needs to be able to say to the Lord, I want 2020 hindsight. I need clarity, and I want to be able to see clearly over some things that have happened throughout the course of my life that I don't yet understand. Now, I'm not suggesting to you, as I said last week, that God created every problem in your life or that God was desiring of you to experience every painful experience of your life. I'm not suggesting that to you at all. But what I'm telling you is that with 2020 hindsight, you can look back at some point on your life and begin to realize, okay, now I understand why that happened. Now I understand why that person was so rude to me that day. They had just gotten the worst news of their life and they were just short. And now I understand why they walked out or now I understand why I didn't get that job or now I understand why I didn't marry into that family because I would have had that mother-in-law <laughs> I'm sorry I just had to shake that for a moment I, now I get it I get it and I wanted to know church God wants to give you 2020 hindsight but what I cannot tell you is that that day to see clearly about everything in the past is going to be today. But I stand before you lifting up God's word and lifting up his promises to tell you that in the days to come, you will understand all of this very clearly. Very clearly. Sometimes you wonder, man, why did I even move to Atlanta? Why did I take that job? Why did I buy that house? Why did this? Why did that happen? Well, listen, hold on. Because one day you're going to understand it more clearly than you do right now. I can remember as a young man, I was called when I was living in Lake Charles, Louisiana. I moved down there because my dad had taken a promotion with the J.C. Penney Company. And uh, I was working in the oil field in those days. This was not long out of high school. But before I left Monroe, Louisiana, where Missy lived, and that's where we started dating before I moved a couple hundred miles down to Lake Charles. I had applied to work at the Coca-Cola company in Monroe, there's a bottling plant, and uh, I got a call that they wanted me to come in for an interview, so I went back to Monroe and I had an interview and was offered a job, and so I was thrilled to move back to Monroe because I would have been closer to Missy, which I knew was the will of God, I mean, hey, I just, I knew that, and so I go to work Coca-Cola, get back up there and start living with some friends and, and an apartment and, and okay, okay, it doesn't matter that we moved every time rent came due. That's beside the point. I don't even want to talk about that. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We didn't do that. But I'm there and I'm working for them and I'm driving a truck and I'm delivering Coca-Cola products and, and, and things are going well. And I come in one day and there's a note on my time card that said, Mr. and then had his name wants to see you as soon as you come in. And this Mr. had a real name, but we had some other names for him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was he was the sales manager. One of those names was Bulldog, and uh, that was the nicer one. And so uh, Mr. Bulldog wanted to see me that day, so I went right to his office, knocked on his door, 
and uh, he said, come in, and I went in, and he was there, and the assistant sales manager was there, and he said, sit down, which I was thankful for because I was about to fall down anyway, and thinking, oh my God, I ran over a little old lady today and killed her somewhere on my route, and I didn't know it, or I, I accidentally stole some money, or I forgot to do this or do that, and I'm thinking, this is it, my head's on the chopping block, I'm going home, only to have a brief conversation to hear them say, we have a distribution plant 20 miles north of here in Bastrop, Louisiana, and the guy who's been running that for us had a heart attack he survived and he's going to be okay but he's going to have to retire early and we would like to offer you that position as the sales manager for that distribution center would you accept it and I, I almost looked around thinking somebody else had to walk in the room uh, and and so I said uh, yes sir I, I would be honored and I was 19 years of age 19 the youngest manager that that company had ever had up to that point and I don't say that as a humble brag, I'm just setting the stage. And so I accepted the position, I turned 20 just before I started, but I had men working for me who had worked for the company lo longer than I was alive. They had worked for Coca-Cola for more years than I had even been on this planet. And God favored us and we saw amazing increases and I began to meet people like the sheriff and business leaders and, and all these kind of folks, principals and all that kind of stuff. And so I stayed there for about three years and then my dad took opened up a business or bought a business, wanted me to be his manager. Missy and I got married and we went into ministry only for about a year and a half later to be offered a position full-time in ministry, which is what was in our hearts to do. And it was in the city called Bastrop, Louisiana, where I had served with the Coca-Cola company, where I built all these relationships. And when that happened, I was able to see more clearly then why God led me there through business because all of a sudden doors began to open for our church that perhaps would have never opened before and God's favor was in a new way all because God had done something at a time that I didn't understand it leading up to a time when I would begin to understand it and I'm just presenting to you today a couple stories to tell you that there's something that's happened in your life and you're still scratching your head and you're still trying to figure it out but I want you to know your day's going to come. You're going to look back and say, no, now I get it. Now I see it. I'm understanding it now. And God's going to give you in that moment 2020 hindsight. Can you receive that today? Because you just hope to God that it's going to happen more sooner than later. I believe that's what God has for you. I believe it's what he has for you. So then secondly, and I'm skipping quickly, there, I believe God wants to give you 2020 insight. So there's 2020 hindsight looking backward, but then we need the ability to gain an understanding of things that are happening as they happen. We don't just need to wait until one day and go, okay, now I got it. Sometimes what we need is God to give us clarity over why is it happening right now just like this. Because sometimes you don't have an opportunity to wait. You need to know right then. Now this is a side note, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Two of those are a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. I believe that those are two aspects of spiritual gifts that God wants to give to his people to give us wisdom in the moment and insight into the moment and guidance into things that are happening in the present time. Because the truth is, is that you don't always have the ability to wait before you make a decision, before you choose to act, or before something happens in your life. And it's in those moments that I believe the Spirit of the Lord wants to give you 2020 insight. Because if you wait too long, the problem could get worse. If you wait too long, the situation could crumble before you. And so there are going to be times that you'll need insight right then. Let me give you an example. Nehemiah in the Old Testament hears that the gates of the city of Jerusalem and the walls have been destroyed. And he's called before the king in a pagan country. And he comes and stands before the king. And the king says, Nehemiah, why has your countenance fallen? And he says, well, king, the gates and the city walls of Jerusalem have been destroyed and burnt with fire. And the king says, what do you want me to do for you? And the Bible says, Nehemiah prayed and said. Nehemiah prayed and said. He didn't have time to call a gathering of people together and say, look, let's lay this before the Lord and try to wait a while to give him an answer. The king said, what do you want me to do? 
What do you need to do? And Nehemiah prayed and he said, I want to tell you right now, there are going to come times in your life that you won't have an opportunity to call the church, put it on the prayer list, reach out to CBN, TBN, or the prayer tower in Tulsa, or contact Benny Hinn. You're going to need to pray and make a decision. You'll need to pray and say something. And it's in those moments, church, that the Holy Spirit of the living God will give you illumination, will give you insight into this is what's going on. This is what you need to do. And if you don't believe that if you never had that happen then you don't have children because <laughs> sometimes you can't wait you better make a decision right now second king six elijah prayed oh lord open his eyes and let him see and the lord opened the young man's eyes and when he looked up he saw that the hillside all around elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire this is the servant of elisha who had looked out and seen the enemy encamped about them and encompassing around them and the servant of elisha is scared and fearful for his life and elisha just prayed lord open his eyes and let him see can I tell you that insight is that ability to understand what's happening right now that God can give to you and God wants you to have. You don't have to wait always to get down the road and look backward and say, oh, okay, now I get it. Sometimes you're going to need that insight right then. When I stood in that room with those two men and they offered me that position, I said, yes, sir, I'll take it. And I shook their hand. We didn't pray together. We didn't call a fast. We didn't let the church know. It was business. They offered me a job. They told me how much they could pay me. I knew that was the Holy Ghost. I said, yes, sir, I'll take it. And walking to my car that day, it hit me. I didn't even pray about this. Now, at that point, I've only been back in my relationship with the Lord for a brief period of time. And as soon as I had that thought, I became overwhelmed that I had made a horrible decision without even praying about it. And the Lord in his goodness and his grace, kind of this is the way it felt to me. You could argue it, but you weren't there. You don't know. It was like he leaned over heaven and he said, son, it's okay. I didn't give you that job for you. I gave you that job for me. And I'm going to show you one day why I've opened this door for you. And I was in overwhelm with his peace. You, it may not happen just like that for you, but you're going to need 20-20 insight. Sometimes this is one of the greatest prayers that a parent can pray over their child when you know they're dating the person that you don't want them to date. I'm looking away right now. I ain't even, I ain't even gonna talk about Summer or SJ because they're with good people. Gary, I love you, man. You, you're a good guy. You're a good guy. And Tina, you know I love you. You gave us Cooper and Maddox. Dear God in heaven, giving us Hudson. Y'all are, are good people, so I'm not talking about you. But sometimes as a parent, you need to pray. Lord, open their eyes. Lord, help them to see what's going on. Well, they don't get it right now. And I don't have enough time to wait for them to get it 20 years from now. They need to get it right now. And I think that's the same prayer we all need to pray. Lord, give me some insight into what's happening right now. And then lastly, is 2020 foresight. You see, there's hindsight that's looking backward. There's insight that's looking inward. And then there's foresight. That God wants to help us to see some things that are still yet down the road. See, foresight is the ability to predict what will happen or be needed in the future. Now, don't get weird about this because some people have taken this concept and they've distorted it and tried to use it in a manipulative way. I've shared this story a number of times, but some of you haven't heard it yet. When we lived in New Orleans, I know Dell and Cheryl will understand this, and I usually refer to them when I've mentioned this story. When we lived in New Orleans, we'd go downtown, and right there on Jackson Square, you remember how on the, on the front road is, is the river and Cafe Du Monde, blessed be the name of the Lord. You remember it's right over here on this left-hand side with you, back to, back to the cathedral. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Cafe Du Monde's right over there. And... Um, so then you've got the whole square area, and in those days, it, with, with your back to, to the cathedral, uh, this side of the Jackson Square were all the artists, painters, and sculptors and stuff, and then in the front of the cathedral were the music musicians, and then over on this side of Jackson Square were the tarot card readers, tea readers, uh, fortune tellers, all those folks, they were on this side, and it was very segregated. Artists over here, painters, sculptors, musicians over here, and then the tarot card readers, tea readers, fortune tellers, and all of that. And in order to set up a business in Jackson Square, you have to have a license from the city of New Orleans. 
And as we would walk around, we would always avoid this side over here and wouldn't be pulled into, hey, can we read your palm or tell you your future or whatever? Um, we just, we wouldn't get involved in any of that. Well, one night we're watching the news and they're talking about how the city of New Orleans is going to limit the number of licenses for these vendors around Jackson Square. And they were interviewing one of the people who was a fortune teller. And this person is just expressing how frustrated they are that they may not get their license renewed. They may be out of business. They may have to move, go somewhere else. Or they may just lose everything. And they're just getting all emotional. And I start laughing. We're watching the news. Missy and I start laughing. And she said, what's so funny? I said, did you hear that? She goes, yeah. Why is that funny? I said, because they should have seen it coming. <laughs> They're going to take my body and tell me about tomorrow, and they don't know they're not going to get their license renewed. <laughs> the Bible uses the phrase, it will come to pass, or one of its derivatives, 526 times in the Old Testament and 87 times in the New Testament. 613 times God's Word says, it will come to pass. This is going to happen. I want you to know, church, that not only does God want you to be able to look backwards and say, okay, now I get it, or when something's unfolding in that moment to say, now I know what I need to do. The Lord gave me a word of knowledge or wisdom, or I, I had this impression, or I, I felt impressed of the Lord. I know this is what I need to do. This is what's going on right now. I've got to make a decision. I've got to choose an action, and he gives me insight. But God wants to help us have 2020 foresight where we're being able to say, God, I may not know when, and I may not know how, but I just sense in my heart or I just believe in my spirit that there's something coming down the road and I want to be prepared for that I want to have 2020 foresight I don't want you to keep these things veiled from me I want to know I need to know and God will give you that that's part of that prophetic nature of the Holy Spirit and that's not just true for people in the pulpit that's true for people in the chair people in the pew normal folks like all of us who say God I don't want to just walk into my future blindly give me some insight right now help me to see behind me but also give me foresight so that I can better understand what is it that you're doing and let me show you an example Isaiah 42 9 God says, everything I prophesied has come true. And now I will prophesy again. I will tell you the future before it happens. Can I help us to understand, church? The only person, not these folks over here, not the folks on the California Psychic Hotline or whatever else, not your horoscope, nobody else knows your future but God. Because God is the only one who's already standing in your future wanting you to understand that he has a future and a hope and good things for you and blessings for you. For you and he's going to lead you and guide you so with confidence you can say I may not know what tomorrow holds but I know who holds tomorrow and I know he holds my hand yeah. Isaiah 46 10 God says only I can tell you the future before it even happens everything I plan will come to pass for I do whatever I wish and then I'll conclude this part with these verses from the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. Then the Lord told me, I will give you my message in the form of a vision. Write it clearly enough to be read at a glance. At the time I have decided, my words will come true. Listen to verse 3. At the time I have decided, my words will come true. You can trust what I say about the future it may take a long time it may take a long time look at somebody tell them it may take a long time but keep on waiting tell us to keep on waiting and then shout these last three words it will happen that sounds a little bit like last week it will happen God's saying to you I'm gonna reveal something to you now write it down write it down plainly and even though it seems like it's delayed in its fulfillment you keep on waiting because it will happen on Tuesday January 26 2020 pastor Christian would you guys come back this is a significant day on Tuesday, January 6, 2020, which was the 67th anniversary of Life Church Smyrna. Somewhere between midnight and 5.09 a.m. In that five hour and nine minute window, I can't tell you when, 
I think it was just before I awakened at 5.09, but I'm not certain. Somewhere between midnight when I went to bed and 5.09 a.m., I had a dream. In all of my 56 and a half years, if I have even dreamed at all, I have rarely remembered my dreams. This time was different. This dream was different. The moment I awoke, I immediately began remembering my dream. My first inclination was simply was to simply dismiss it, as there seemed to be nothing much to it. But then, just like things in a darkened room become clearer and more visible, and you see with greater clarity when you turn the light on, God began to show me the dream in living color. He began to unfold the significance of this particular dream. This is one of the only dreams I have either ever had or have ever remembered. And here's the dream. I saw many people from many nations. There was a lot of activity taking place. There were a lot of people doing a lot of things. Some people were holding cards like the ones missionaries carry. Some were holding Bibles. The building looked like a school with a lot of people in every classroom. This could have possibly been a ministry training center or maybe a church. I really couldn't tell. There were many people who were waiting to talk to me all at the same time. One African man was trying to read a testimony from his card or some sort of pamphlet. He may have been asking for mission support. I wasn't sure. I either couldn't see their faces or I just don't remember their faces, but there were a lot of people in this building. In the center of the building was a large garden. It looked much like inside a large hotel with a large open space, like an atrium, with rooms surrounding it. I was scrambling to find a hose and trying desperately to turn the water on so that I could water the garden. Many people were walking with me and trying to talk to me, which made watering the garden very difficult. One large area had sod. One smaller area was barren. Most of the rest of the garden had beautiful, lush green plants of various kinds and at various stages of growth. All were desperately needing to receive water. My own mom and dad were there talking to me about a gutter downspout that I had never seen, known about, nor had I ever mentioned it to them. I saw the gutter downspout, which was designed to bring rain from the roof down into the garden. It was clogged. The debris was dry. No water had flowed through it for a very long time. But there was a hose. The hose was smaller, and the water didn't flow like the gutter downspout would have flowed. I used it because it was all I had for watering the garden. A man whom I did not know kept following me and talking to me. At one point, I asked his name and then handed him the hose, telling him and showing him how to water the plants. He jumped in and took over that responsibility. I then awoke at 5.09 a.m. and began asking God for the meaning of the dream, the interpretation of the dream. And here's what he told me. God showed me that many people and many nationalities represent Life Church. It has always been God's plans for us to look like the world which he created and to be comprised of people from all nations, which do now and will occupy heaven. God showed me the garden represents the center of all we do, and it stresses that we must be all about the harvest. With all the surrounding activities, we cannot ever lose sight of the fact that God has called us to be a part of this last day's harvest. God showed me the sodded, barren, and fruitful areas represent people and places we are called to serve. God showed me the sodded areas were once barren, but just like a master gardener does for your yard, he has transplanted healthy sod to start a new area of growth. The sod represents mature Christians whom he has transplanted into Life Church for such a time as this. God showed me the barren places were not actually barren or unfruitful, but they were areas where we have planted seed and now we are watering while we wait for the harvest that is to come. The barren areas represent new Christians who have recently given their lives to Christ, those who are new to Life Church, and who are needing to learn how to live fruitful lives for Christ. God showed me the abundant, beautiful, lush, green areas of the garden at various stages of growth represent future growth as they will be the ones which produce seed and shoots for the days ahead. 
God showed me these are the many, many, many people who have received the seed of the word which we have sown, who have received the refreshing water of the Spirit, and who are maturing in the garden of Life Church. These are the ones from whom the future growth will come. They are the ones who will, who will perpetuate the ministry of Life Church. God showed me the dry downspout is merely an image of what I or we may think has been a reality. That is to say, for times and seasons, I and we have thought God has been withholding the reign of the Spirit or He's not been opening heaven over Life Church for some reason. God stressed that those are merely appearances or images of what we perceive or believe, but it's not the truth. God showed me the water showed me God, God showed me the water hose represents the reality that he has always and that he will always use someone for whom the water will flow as long as they stay connected to him as the source of the living water. The hose is not the water, it is only the conduit through which the water flows. God showed me the man I did not know and to whom I handed the water hose is the person who will follow me as pastor one day. He said that what I am doing now is setting the next pastor up for an even greater harvest as the last days continue to unfold. God showed me through sharing the dream with Missy that my parents were telling me the gutter is connected to a greater source in the heavenlies and the rain of the Spirit is soon to be poured out. They were also showing me that we must get the gutter downspout cleaned of all the debris so the water may flow freely. God showed me the many people who fill the rooms are those he is using for the harvest we are together now and the harvest we are together in the days ahead. Those are people who are here now or who have left and who need to return. God said to tell you this harvest cannot and will not be gathered by just one person or by only a few people. The harvest is too great. The time to gather is too urgent and the harvest will spoil in the field if enough people are not involved in gathering the harvest which he is giving us. God said to tell you, regardless of whether you think your life is represented by the sodded, barren, or, un or fruitful parts of the garden, nobody can survive without the water which only God can give and which God wants to pour out upon them. The water is life. The water is refreshing. The water satisfies. Nothing else can do that for you. And then the Lord reminded me of a vision of the altar that he gave me when I stood right there on Saturday, February the 29th, excuse me, Saturday, February 2nd, 2019, almost a year ago. While praying in the balcony, I sensed the Lord saying the altar will become like a flowing river to refresh people who are weary from carrying burdens. The Lord said the river will be filled with salvation, grace, healing, and restoration so that people will be saved, healed, delivered, and restored. He also said he desires for this river to overflow the banks of our lives and our church so that the waters can flow into our city, county, state, nation, and world. I have to tell you something. I don't usually dream, and if I do, I don't remember them. And ever since that night, I've been having some stupid dreams. But this one... This one's different. This one has meaning. This one has purpose. This one has 2020 hindsight, 2020 insight, and 2020 foresight that I believe God had revealed to me in those moments of that dream, and that I believe now He's asked me to reveal to you. Can we stand together across this place today? I will not tell you that that dream has been elevated to the same stature, position, authority, or should it be embraced? like this revelation that God has given to us. Because the scripture is very clear that there is no prophecy which has personal or private interpretation. But out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Here's what I'm suggesting to you. God would not have revealed that to me as your pastor unless there was a reason for that. I asked Charlene Schuler, who has been a steward for many years, of various words and prophecies that have come forth either through this pulpit by other men and women of God or in other ways. And as I've read through that entire folder of prophecies, I begin to see a common thread and a common stream about what God wants to do in us right now, what he has done in us in the past, and what he wants to do in us in the future and through us in the future. And I want you to know 
that you are here for such a time as this. You are here. You are part of the harvest that God has allowed to already take place, and you are part of the harvest. So whether or not you feel like you are that sodded area that God took a place of barrenness in your life and has supernaturally placed some sod there to begin to grow, or whether you feel like you're unfruitful, I want you to know you're not unfruitful. You have had seed sown into your life. Now the water of God's Spirit is coming along and watering that seed. Or if you feel like, well, I'm mature. I'm growing. I'm I'm already advanced in the garden and man everybody else needs to catch up God wants you to know you're the one through whom future growth is going to come I got to tell you there's a place for everybody there's a place for the parent there's a place for the broken there's a place for the blessed there's a place for the abundant there's a place for everybody in the garden that we call life church and I'm so thankful that you're here and I'm so thankful that right now in this time I can be one of those not the only one but one of those who can take the water hose of God's presence the water hose of his word and refresh your life. I bless you today. I bless you today. I pronounce blessings over your life. Be fruitful. Bring glory to God. Produce growth in other people. Let God use you. He brought you a mighty long way for such a time as this. Can we lift our hands together as the family of God? Father, I bless you. I bless you. I bless you. For every man, every woman, every teenager, every young adult, every child, oh God, who's a part of this great garden called Life Church. I thank you for what you have done. Only by your spirit can lives be changed. Only by your spirit can lives be restored. God, I thank you for what you've done. I thank you, Lord, for all of the 67 years at this church for what you have done. God, I give you praise for that. And at the same time, I thank you for what you're doing right now, in this moment, today. And God, with it anticipation and excitement. I'm looking forward to what you're going to do in all of our tomorrows. Should Jesus carry his coming? Should the, the return of Christ be even somewhat postponed or delayed for the sake of, of a fulfillment of your promise? Then God use us tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Help us to realize that the center of everything that we do must be about the harvest. Thank you for the refreshing water of your spirit. It doesn't just flow here. Oh, it flows every day, everywhere. Lord, if we'll just be open up to you and allow you, oh God, to flow into our lives. Refresh us. Satisfy us. Give us a hunger and a thirst for the right things. Thanks for joining us today. We hope this message ministered to you. We'd love to connect with you online. Our website, www.lifechurchsmyrna.com. Thanks for joining us today. God bless you.